All right, everybody, welcome to uh, a recorded lecture for readings in the graphic novel. This lecture will be an introduction to the idea of comics, what comics are as an art form, as a medium. I'm going to begin by just introducing for people who might be unfamiliar with the subject a bit of the formal vocabulary of comics because we need to you know, just as if you were taking a course in poetry, we'd have to talk about what's a line, what's a stanza, what's a metaphor. If you're taking a course on film, you'd have to learn about close-ups and dissolves and cuts and things. So we still, we need for comics to have a, a basic formal vocabulary. So I'm going to start today's lecture with that. Then I want to discuss, by way of introducing the theory of comics, as to what it is fundamentally as an art form, I want to discuss probably the most famous theoretical work on the subject, which is Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. And I want to not so much use McCloud as our guide to the subject as use McCloud as a starting point for our own thoughts on the subject. So we're going to look at his thoughts and kind of see what we think. I will explain where he's coming from, I'll explain some possible objections to some of where he's coming from, and then uh, we will have a discussion about it later and you will give your own thoughts. And then finally, I want to end today's lecture by talking about the term that is in the title of our course, which I'm not mostly going to use today, which is graphic novel. What is, what is the graphic novel and what is its relation to comics more broadly. So that will be today's uh, today's lecture. So I just want to start by, and you know, for some of you, you know, I know we have a very wide range in this course of prior experience with comics from people coming into it as comic art majors who have really been interested in the subject for a long time to people coming into it to this might be some of their first exposure to the subject. So I just want to make sure we're all completely on the same page or whatever you want to say. So I want to give a very basic list of formal characteristics of comics. So I have on the right of the slide on my image, I have a page of comics for the connoisseurs among you. It's one of Jack Kirby's uh, uh, Jimmy Olsen Superman comics from the 70s. Jack Kirby, for those of you who aren't connoisseurs, was uh, a famous American superhero comics artist. So this is a Jack Kirby drawing Superman in the 70s. And this is just a page of comics, and I'm going to use it to illustrate some of the terms. So when you look at a page of comics, the boxes that contain the images are called panels. So just panels. Sometimes people say panel boxes. You don't need to say that. You can just say panels. Then the spaces between and among the panels. So if you look at the page, there's these white spaces, you know, between and among the panels. Those are called gutters. Now, they're not always white. They're not always uh, straight. They're not always columns sometimes they're just lines it really depends on the comic sometimes it depends on the national tradition of the comic um, this kind of grid like layout is far more common i think in american superhero comics than in other kinds of comics than in certain kinds of manga for instance so you know panels gutters they're not always going to look the same i've picked it i've just picked a very straightforward page here uh, but we still need the basic vocabulary. Then there are word balloons. Those are the usually white, they're not always, uh, spaces that contain the dialogue. So if you look over at my page, let's look at the third panel there. Uh, heads up, friends, we've got another volunteer from Supertown. So, you know, that's a word balloon. And sometimes Conventionally, in Western comics, they have tails. So there'll be a little tail coming off of them pointing to the speaker. I think in other contexts or in other traditions, it's more common. Like, for instance, in manga, they often don't have tails, but just sort of float near the speaker. But those are word balloons. Those are for speech. And then for thought, we have thought balloons, these sort of fluffy-looking balloons that contain the character's thoughts. So you see that in the second panel as Superman is thinking. I can see their costumes, that strange vehicle, etc. Those are thought balloons. And those have really fallen out of fashion in a lot of more modern and contemporary comics. 
um, they've been replaced really by, by the next vocab word, which is captions, which are usually square boxes that contain narration. And if you look at my page there in yellow, so in the fourth panel, the caption says, suddenly, and then there's, you know, the helicopter zapping Superman. Um, and captions contain some kind of narration. In older comics, they were often somewhat redundant, the, you know, and you can see that. Let's look at the fifth panel. Superman is struck hard by a series of Sigma blasts and rolls to avoid contact with this unknown explosive, which is what's depicted in the drawing. So um, they were often redundant. They just repeated what was shown. And so, so you know, we can look upon the, that fondly as a, as a kind of naive feature of older comics, but more recent and more, let's say, artful comics use captions to provide a wholly different information stream and so a lot of times instead of thought balloons you have captions which convey what the character is thinking alongside the imagery so the words the narration is not simply reduplicating reduplicating is itself probably redundant duplicating the imagery so those are captions and then finally, sound effects, words representing sounds, usually freestanding, which is to say not in balloons, often onomatopoeic. So you see that in panels uh, four and five here, zap, zarap, as Superman is uh, hit by the so-called sigma blasts. So those are the most basic formal characteristics, uh, the most basic kind of vocabulary words. So like I said, a lot of you will know these already. If you don't know these, you might want to keep these in mind so you can use these words in our discussion in your, in your own writing on comics uh, for this semester. I have a couple more, just a few more. Number one is a splash, which is to say when you see a page with only one large panel. Um, and that could be sometimes it's an introductory page, so it might be the first page or the second page of the comic that gives you the title of that issue and the credits, you know, who did the writing and drawing, etc. Sometimes it is used sort of as a, uh, as a, to illustrate a high point, a climactic event. There'll be a page with only one image. So a splash is a page with only one image. Then we have a two-page spread. This is when you have a splash or a multiple panel page. It, it doesn't really matter. But the point of a two-page spread is that ext it, it extends over two facing pages. So you have a spread. I mean, this isn't just a comics term, really. This is just a print term. So you, know, you probably know what a spread is. Similarly, I think bleed is a print term as well. That's when the image in one or more panels goes to the edge of the page. So instead of having a panel that's a square box containing the image, the image goes right up against the, the margin. And then finally, emanata, which are lines surrounding a character indicating a state of mind or emotion, which is illustrated in my image by an image of Spider-Man with his spider sense tingling, which I think is probably the most famous form of emanata in superhero comics. If you're not a Spider-Man fan, he had this you know, he would feel sort of uh, alarmed. He had this sort of um, anxiety when something was approaching that approximated the, the spiders kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, even to explain it sounds kind of stupid. If trouble was ahead, he sensed it, which he somehow got from, from having spider powers. But the point is, <laughs> my only point is that it's emanata. It's lines surrounding a character over a character's head indicating a state of mind or emotion. So just a couple more vocabulary words to, you know, provide us a basis for discussing the formal features of comics when we're looking at a comics page. Now, what, though, is comics? I'm sort of saying comics as if to take it for granted, but you can define a form of art, a type of art, um, in, in ways that are very basic that sort of tell you what it is. And so how, so let's, let's just say like, um, you know, poetry is a literary composition that uses lines and sometimes other features like rhyme or meter uh, 
to communicate some thought or feeling. Or we could say that sculpture is a three-dimensional artistic object. Um, and you, you see how every time you define an art form, you sort of separate it off from other art forms by specifying certain minimal features that it has to contain to be that thing. So generally, poetry at least has to have lines. That is, you know, not sentences, but lines that don't go all the way to the end of the page. Sculpture generally has to be in three dimensions. Uh, painting generally has to be made of, you know, done with paint. Um, so what can we, how is it that we can get comics boiled down to that sort of definition that tells us what it is as opposed to what other forms of art are why is a comic a comic and not a poem not a sculpture not a painting and interestingly um the most famous attempt to theorize this came rather late in the history of the art form or the medium of comics and it came in 1993 with Scott McCloud's aesthetic treatise, Understanding Comics, the Invisible Art. So Scott McCloud was a comics creator. He was born in 1960 in Boston, and he was a cartoonist who had done some independent comics over the course of the 80s. But, and, and they were like science fictional adventure stories. But he was thinking, you know, what is this? art form what is this medium and i'm sort of using those two terms interchangeably it's a medium of communication but it's also a form of art so what is this and how can i define it and you have to understand that mcleod's working against a, a background he's doing this in america he's writing this book in the early 90s so you have to understand what comics the context was for thinking about comics at this period so when so as we'll see one of the controversies this book addresses is when does comics as an art form begin and mcleod wants to argue and it is possible to argue that it's not only centuries old but it's millennia old and we'll get there i have a slide about that but before i do for all practical purposes comics as we know them today emerge at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century and the context in which they emerge is the following. In many parts of the world, including the United States, most of Western Europe, and Japan, which are the three places where comics really emerge and create their own independent traditions, you have urbanization. You have the growth of cities. You have the movement of these countries from an agrarian agricultural economy to an industrial economy, from an economy centered on the rural to an economy centered on the urban. Mm. So you have people pouring into cities, whether that be New York or Paris or Tokyo. People are pouring into cities to get work. Um, they're coming from the countryside or they're coming, in the case of the United States, as immigrants from other countries. And now you have cities full of people and they need to be informed and they need to be entertained. And previous forms of entertainment and instruction and information aren't necessarily going to cut it. So you have the growth. I mean, so you have the growth of newspapers. Now, newspapers had existed since the 18th century, essentially, even a little before that. But they become more prominent and more important as cities grow. And newspapers contain news and information and in fact propaganda that's the front of the newspaper but they also contain entertainment and one of the forms of entertainment they began to contain was the comics page the comic strips and this really starts in ways we would recognize today in the 1890s and there's a famous you know there's a famous comic strip that's often called the first comic strip called the yellow kid and then from the yellow kid which is a story about a young child who wears a yellow uh sort of uh what a babies wear like a not like the not like a onesie but like a baby gown and it was yellow and it would contain sort of his dialogue and then he's wandering through 
this sort of tenement, these tenement neighborhoods in the city. And so from there, you got the whole development of the comic strip. But the point I want to make is that while there were a lot of accomplished and and uh, popular works in the form of the comic strip, this was the beginning of the association of comics, particularly in the United States, uh, with a low form of art, with the sort of lowest common denominator form of art, because it was associated with this sort of cheap form of entertainment that appeared in newspapers that especially back then were little more than sensationalist propagandistic things. And so this is where the association of comics with unseriousness comes from, that they're not a serious form of art or literature. And then uh, if you go forward a few years in the 1930s, and I'm, I'm going to stick with the United States for now, we'll talk about the development of comics in Europe and Japan later in the semester. Um, in the United States, you have the development of the comic book, which was a stapled kind of saddle-stitched pamphlet that contained at first reprints of comic strips that were sold independently where magazines and newspapers were sold, and then original content. Because once the comic book selling reprints was successful, they decided, the publishers decided, and these were very cheap publishers. Often they were, um, often comic book publishers at the very start of the comic book industry were uh, just sort of money laundering operations for the mafia. You can look that up. It's a little bit far afield from our subject. But anyway, then once the comic book that was reprinting material was successful, they said, well, let's do original content. That could be even more successful. And in trying to come up with original content, they developed the idea of the superhero, starting with Superman in 1938. And the superhero becomes in the United States almost identical with the idea of comics. When people thought of comics when Scott McCloud was doing this book in 1993, when the average normal person, whatever that means, thought of comics, that person would think of superhero comics. Because from the 30s up until the 90s, that's not all that American comics were, but that was what they mostly were in the public eye. And if they didn't think of superheroes, they would think of the sort of funny animal cartoons in the newspaper. They would think of Garfield or Snoopy or whatever. And so that is the context in which Scott McCloud is uh, making his theoretical intervention into the world of comics. He is dealing with a world that still, for the most part, thinks comics is for kids or for people who just um, aren't really capable of reading anything quote-unquote more sophisticated. So he's taking on this ingrained cultural snobbery. I mean, it's on the one hand, it's snobbery. It's just merely looking down at the lower classes, which is a, is a bad thing. But on the other hand, it was a recognition that comics was a, a fairly crassly commercial industry that was often pretty hostile to any kind of innovation or experimentation in the United States because it was just trying to make the, the quickest and fastest money. So in one sense, this impression was very wrong and very really prejudiced. But in another sense, they were it, it could have been a correct assessment of the actual business practices, which I think Scott McCloud very much wanted to change. So McCloud wants to define comics in a way that moves them away from the preconceptions of what they are, that they're a commercial product featuring entertainment for children or for people who are fairly unsophisticated and can only handle Superman and Garfield. Now listen, I like Superman and Garfield. I'm not criticizing Superman and Garfield. I don't even think McCloud is really criticizing Superman and Garfield. But what he's trying to do is get away from the preconception that that's all that this medium is or could be about. And so what he wants to do is define comics not by its preconceived subject matter, cartoon cats and superheroes, but by its basic intrinsic formal properties. And in doing this, many of his ideas, <clears throat> as we'll see, have became very basic to the study of comics. And we're going to use throughout, his, throughout this course some of his ideas because they um, 
are basically a shared vocabulary for the study of comics, especially some of his formal vocabulary. Now, on the other hand, other of his ideas are much more questionable, and we're going to talk about those as well. We're going to talk about some of the critiques that could be made of Scott McCloud. I want to put McCloud in one more context of his own before getting into his definition of comics. So the book is called Understanding Comics, and this itself is an allusion to a prior book with understanding in its title which itself was an allusion to a prior book with understanding in its title. So McLeod is self-consciously placing himself in a certain lineage. The lineage is this. In 1938, there is a textbook published called Understanding Poetry. And this textbook that's pictured on the left hand of my slide widely influenced the study of poetry at the college level in America. So the idea that you would study English language literature in college is a much newer idea than you might think. It really gets started around the mid 19th century and it was considered a kind of disreputable field for people not smart enough to study literature in, Gre in Greek and Latin for a long time. And it took a long time for the field of English language literature to be considered a truly professional scholarly field. And the uh, new criticism, as it was called in the early 20th century, was this idea of looking at English language literature from a formal perspective. What are its formal properties? And that would be the basis of the professionalization of its study. So it's really only with the new criticism in the early 20th century that... Um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, what was I saying? Um, it's only in the early 20th century with the new criticism that English language literary study gets professionalized and becomes respectable. And one of the marks of this was a textbook called Understanding Poetry. Let's go forward another generation. In 1964, a, an English, uh, critic, uh, that is to say a, a, a person whose PhD was in English language, literary studies was in English, a Canadian academic named Marshall McLuhan wanted to begin studying not just literature, but other media as such in a scholarly way. And so he writes a book called Understanding Media, with the title being a clear allusion back to understanding poetry, with his intention being the same that the authors of understanding poetry had. They wanted to put the study of English language literature on a professional scholarly footing by approaching it at the formal level. So McLuhan wanted to put the study of other media, such as cinema and television and radio, and in fact, he has a chapter on comics, though it's not a very good one. Uh, he wants to put all of these other media on the same scholarly professional footing by attending to their formal level. That's his key idea. The biggest, the most famous sentence McLuhan writes in this book is the medium is the message, which is to say that the most important thing about any media are its formal properties, and they are what really communicate to you, not the content it conveyed. So like the new critics before him who took a formal approach to literature, mm -hmm. he takes a formal approach to other forms of media like cinema, radio, television. And then flash forward another generation, so we're going from the 30s to the 60s to the 90s, mm -hmm. Scott McCloud, who I think is very conscious of this, titles his book Understanding Comics, and he wants to take comics and put them on a professional scholarly footing by focusing on their formal properties. So that's the lineage in which McLeod is, I think, self-consciously placing himself. And the difference, though, is unlike McLuhan, who wrote, well, unlike all of these people, so the authors of Understanding Poetry wrote prose about poetry. McLuhan wrote prose about cinema, TV, radio, and other media. 
McCloud does something much more radical, which is that he writes a comic about comics. He sort of proves his own thesis by showing that comics can do more than superheroes, can do more than funny animals. You could do a philosophical aesthetic treatise in the form of comics. But I also think that the medium is the message is also a key theme in McCloud's book. I think one of the things that's not always been well understood about this book is that he's making an argument for the importance of comics in the history of art that we'll have to attend to. That it doesn't matter what the comic is about, the mere fact that something is a comic is crucial to a certain kind of work it can do for us in the realm of culture that no other form of art or form of media can do. Comics conveys a way of thinking just by virtue of being a comic that is special, that is different. And in that sense, the medium is the message. So that's that. I, I just wanted to give you that broader context. Now, I want now to go through some of McLeod's key ideas. Not all of them. It's a, it's a big book with a lot of different topics. He goes into excursions about uses of color and things. I'm going to sort of ignore all that. I just want to get to his most key ideas about what comics are and what they can do and what role they play overall in the history of art and culture. So his first move is to give a formal definition of comics, to say, forget everything, every preconceived idea you have about what a comic is. Forget the colorful saddle-stitched pamphlets or the daily black and white newspaper strips. Forget superheroes, forget funny animals, forget Garfield, forget Superman. Dump all of that out. He uses a metaphor of a pitcher. He says, all the things that you think of that comics are about are what's in the pitcher, but you can dump that out. Or I think he drinks it in the, in the comic, and you're left with the vessel. And that's what he's after. What is the vessel? What is the form? What is the medium? What's the most basic definition we could make of this akin to a sculpture as a three-dimensional artistic object, a poem is a kind of lined literary composition. And he borrows from Will Eisner, who was a famous comics artist, this two-word phrase, sequential art. The essence of comics is when you take at least two images and you deliberately put them next to each other to convey something, information, an aesthetic effect, a story, whatever. Comics is sequential art. So the most basic unit of comics is two images deliberately placed in sequence. And he then elaborates on that a little bit. And he's, you know, he's very funny. He dramatizes himself in the book as explaining this to an audience. And the audience is saying things like, what about Batman or whatever? And he's like, forget that. Uh, he's saying, but they, they're asking him questions. So he tries to pare it down. And he gives this kind of legalistic um, dictionary definition. Comics is juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence. So deliberate sequence is important because you could walk into a museum and you could see, you know, uh, a couple, you know, two paintings next to each other on the wall, but you're not supposed to look at them together. You're supposed to look at one and then go look at the other. Comics is when you're putting two images next to each other to be looked at together, intended to convey information and or to produce an aesthetic response in the viewer. And he it's interesting that he gives those two things, because I've been saying a medium and an art form. Um, and, you know, language is a medium, but you can also use it to create literature, um, which is an art form. So comics is both a medium and it's a medium you can use to create art, but it's also a medium in which you could simply give information. And then I would say the other important thing is that they are juxtaposed in a deliberate spatial sequence. So, you know, film, especially when it was on film, were images that were in a spatial sequence that were run through a machine so quickly that they created the illusion of a smooth temporal sequence. But comics is always just a spatial sequence. So that is, that is the... That is the sort of atomic level definition 
of what comics is that McCloud gets down to. And I just want to think briefly here about some objections we could make to this. So one objection is that this definition, and it sounds really good, and he's very, he's sort of a dazzling theoretician, and when you read him, at least I have the experience, when you read him, you believe him. But you need to step back and think, well, is this actually true? Could I make some objections to this? And I think there's a couple objections you could make to this. Number one, the idea of, a, of, of needing two images to constitute comics is a little strange when you think of the fact that the single panel cartoon has long been a part of comics. Um, the single panel cartoon, particularly like the political cartoon in newspapers, it's always been, you know, associated with comics. And the single panel cartoon was just one panel, but it had in it words. And many comics, you know, many people who think about comics have suggested, you know, they've tried to do what McLeod has tried to do in a kind of informal way and say, well, what is comics essentially? And some of them have said, for instance, Alan Moore, the English comics writer, he has certainly said that when he thinks of comics, the essence of it is a combination of words and images. That for him, it's the word and the picture together that makes comics, not the juxtaposition of images. If you don't have words, it's not comics. Now, there are objections to that because there are wordless comics. I think we, anybody who's read comics for any length of time can think of examples of comics without words. So, um, so what, what, are we, what are we dealing with here? We have, we have sequential art on the one hand. We have the objection that single panel cartoons have always been part of comics. We have the objection that words and pictures are an integral part of the definition of comics. We're in kind of a definitional crisis. What should we do? Um, the first thing we should do is we should remind ourselves that if McLeod's definition is too restrictive, and I think it probably is, he was nevertheless doing it for the good reason that he needed to come up with a definition of comics as a form if he wanted to put it on a footing with other forms of art and media, like literature, like film, like painting, like, like photography, like sculpture, because all of these have debates about what their definitions are. So he's making this very basic move of coming up with a formal definition because that's what you have to do if you want to begin this conversation that will get something into the door of a kind of um, uh, cultural respectability and centrality. So in that sense, I don't blame him for trying to do this. And he makes kind of, you know, it's a kind of power move he makes at the opening of the book, and I, I understand rhetorically why he does it. I think now that it's, you know, almost 30 years later, and we are in a college course on comics, and there are many college courses on comics, and this... Um, challenge of getting comics taken seriously isn't as pressing that that so much progress has been made on that front i think we can relax a little and i think we don't need to be so strict in our definitions and the way i personally like to think of it is you know while we're talking philosophically there's a 20th century philosopher named wittgenstein w-i-t-t-g-n-s-t-i E S T E I N Wittgenstein Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, I don't know if I spelled that right or not. <laughs> and he uh, said he he thought about one of the things he thought a lot about as a philosopher is defining things and how hard it could be to define things. And he his example was games. He said there's so many different things we could call a game that it's hard to come up with one word that would cover all of them, that would cover chess and solitaire and tennis and hopscotch and, and uh, you know, and poker. You know, they're, they're, these things are so different from each other and we call them all games, but it's hard to come up with one definition that satisfies them all because some of them you play by yourself, some of them you play with other people, some of them are uh, full body physical activities, some of them are not, etc. And so he came up with this idea that he called family resemblances, that instead of trying to provide a strict definition for a concept, you could say that the name given to a series of phenomena didn't have to cover every single aspect of them. They could just cover all the ways in which they were like each other, just as 
you know, your family, you, your family has a name and you're all related in some ways and you're similar in others. You're related in some ways, you're, you're similar to each other in, in some ways, you're different from each other in other ways, but you're all part of that family. So in that way, we can say the single panel cartoon, the wordless comic, uh, these are all part of the comics family. They have some resemblances, but not others to other comics. That's how I prefer to think of it. So I don't think we need a very restrictive definition of the kind McLeod provides. But he, again, just to repeat, I think, I, I kind of think he needed to do it. And so I don't fault him for doing it, but I think it's it's for us to be mindful of uh, of of the alternatives and that this isn't the only way to think about it. So moving on, though, one of the things that McLeod's very general definition of comics as sequential art allows him to do is to drastically expand the field of comics. If all comics is or are, I think he says it, I think he says it's singular, but I always say it plural. If all comics are, are juxtaposed, deliberately juxtaposed images, McLeod says, then they're much older than the 1890s because you can look around at so many uh, places in the history, the global history of art, and find juxtaposed images intended to convey information, tell a story, or create an aesthetic effect. You can look at the uh, pre-Columbian Maya manuscripts, which use juxtaposed images to tell the epic stories of their culture. You could look at the medieval uh, tapestries of Europe, like the Bio Tapestry, which narrates the Norman Conquest in a sequence of juxtaposed images. You could look at uh, the uh, the reliefs in Rome. You could look at Trajan's Column or the reliefs that run around the tops of Roman temples. You could possibly even go back to the uh, the cave art, the earliest examples of art found in human history, the cave paintings at Lascaux. And you could say all of these things are comics if what comics are are juxtaposed images. And again, it's very clear why he's doing this, because he's trying to establish a place for comics in the history of art. He's trying to say this is a serious form of art. We need to take it as seriously as we take other forms of art. And so by defining it in such a way as to redefine many of the things that are already in our museums and in our art history textbooks as comics, he says, you've been studying comics as serious art without even knowing it. And that's what it means to say that the Bayou Tapestry or the Maya Codicils or the cave paintings at Lascaux are comics. Now, this is a powerful gesture. It opens up a lot of worlds. It opens up a lot of avenues of investigation. I think if you're a comics creator, it drastically expands your uh, what you think you know your lineage is and what you could be influenced by. And so, for all those reasons, I think it's a good move. Could we say it's a bad move for other reasons? Sure. Um, you know, maybe it matters that the people who made these artifacts and objects didn't think of them in terms of comics. Perhaps in that sense, he's um, being almost, uh, if, if I could use a strong term, like a cultural imperialist about this. He's kind of going around the world and claiming things for comics that weren't made with comics in mind or with any concept of comics. And so in that way, maybe to, to think of them in that light is to be false to their nature, to be false to what they are. Um, and so in that way, it's, a, it's maybe a, a, a more questionable, even ethically questionable move. So I leave it to you to think about. Like I said, I think it's a mixed bag of a, of a gesture. I think there's good things about it and bad things about it. But again, it's a powerful argumentative move where he reframes the idea of comics so that it includes what is... All so let me think, let's think of it this way. Instead of having to tell the reader, comics can be serious art, uh, even though what you think of comics aren't very serious, he says he sort of reverses the position. A lot of what you think of as serious art is comics. You just didn't know it. 
So he's arguing there from a very strong position. So this book is a really great kind of argumentative rhetorical text, even if we disagree with it. And we should disagree with it, but it's but I want to emphasize that it, it, it's very persuasive in the argumentative moves that it makes. Uh, even when, you know, you step back and think about them, they don't quite hold up. So that's the idea of comics ancient lineage. Another very useful thing McLeod does is he comes up with this pyramid of styles. He wants to, um, part of his attempt to dissociate comics from the preconceptions people have of them, which I've sort of used Superman and Garfield as, as my scapegoat here. Uh, you know, comics aren't just Superman and Garfield. He wants to create a, uh, a kind of chart of all the different visual styles comics can have. So he creates this, I'm calling it a pyramid, but what I have pictured here is a triangle. And he says there's basically three extremes you could go to. The first extreme, we're going to go from, from left to right, and then we'll go from, uh, from bottom to top. So let's start at the left. Inside his triangle, the first extreme is the most extremely realistic image that can be created. And in his view, the other side, so inside the triangle is the most realistic art you could create on the far left. What's outside of the left of the triangle is just reality itself. And so inside the triangle from reality is the art that most nearly approximates reality. And then as you progress to the right across the bottom of the pyramid, the uh, realistic image breaks down and becomes more and more what I call iconic. So it becomes more and more not a representation of a face, but an icon meant to indicate a face. So the extreme left is... What, so I've used three words here, the iconic, the mimetic, and the abstract. So the mimetic is the realistic. You can use those two words interchangeably. So you go from the most realistic, the thing that most looks like a real face, to the most iconic, which is a an oval, two dots, and a line for eyes and a mouth. The most, the, the, the most you could pare down an image to just barely indicate a face which is an icon. And on the other side of the right of the pyramid is language, which is um, not actually, it doesn't resemble what it describes at all. It has a wholly arbitrary relation to what it describes. The word face in no way resembles a face. So language is in that sense maximally an icon because it bears no relation to what it represents. So that's the the bottom of the pyramid, from the most realistic to the most iconic. Then if you go up the pyramid, what you find is you move not from realism toward the icon, indicating the real, but you move away from the real to the constituent elements of which a real picture may be composed, which are colors, shapes, forms, lines. Mm -hmm. So you're moving toward the picture plane. So just as um, abstract art doesn't, you know, claim to be a picture of anything, it's just an arrangement of color, shapes, and forms to make you aware of the picture plane, as in a variety of modern painters from Mondrian to Rothko. So as you go up the pyramid, you go from realism to abstraction. And again, note what McLeod is doing. He's saying the whole world of the visual arts is available for comics, not just what you see in a superhero comic, which is sort of in the middle of the reality to iconic uh, scheme. The, the, the face in the middle looks a lot like, you know, how Superman would have looked in mid 20th century comics. It's not just that. And it's not just cartoon cats and cartoon ducks and cartoon dogs. It's the entire world of the visual arts, including Mondrian and Rothko, including everything that's been done in the visual arts. So everything in this book is intended to expand your idea of what comics can do. And this, no less than his definition of comics as sequential art and his giving of comics an ancient lineage, is his insistence that comics can be mimetic, 
uh, mimetic, can be iconic, or can be abstract. And throughout our course, I want us to think about the art we look at in terms of this, or where, where are the artists we're looking at, where do they fall? And we're going to see some pretty extreme um, examples right off, the, right off the bat in terms of uh, what we're going to look at. We're going to see some very iconic cartooning. We're going to see some very realistic drawing throughout the semester and, and points between. The other thing McLeod does to define comics is he says, okay, you've got this definition of comics as sequential art, as two images in juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. So he says that what um, the signature effect of comics is as a medium is its forcing of you to find imaginatively a relation between the juxtaposed images. Because what comics gives you is it gives you two images and then you have to use your mind to close the gap between the images to imagine what they have to do with each other. And he's actually pulling this pretty straight from McLuhan. McLuhan distinguishes between two kinds of media, one he calls hot and one he calls cold. And hot media is the kind of media that requires the least imaginative engagement from the from the audience. So he defines just plain writing as hot. Writing is very explanatory. It sort of tells you everything you need to know. You just have to read it. But he defines other types of media. And, and McLuhan, when he talks about comics, defines comics as cold. That requires a much higher degree of participation. You have to work a lot harder to fill in the gaps. And McLeod says closure is the signature effect of comics. It's what comics basically is, is your imaginative traversal of these juxtaposed images and you're constantly filling in the gaps between and among them. And this also is a, is a reply to people who think comics are for unsophisticated uh, you know, stupid people who can't read anything more serious, uh, because this was a charge. You know, people, especially back back when McLeod was doing this, people would say, "Oh, you should read a real book. Comics will rot your brain." And what they had in mind was the idea that in a real book, quote unquote, a word, a, a book that just has language in it, you're being asked to envision what the language describes. But in a comic, you're just being spoon fed imagery. And so you have to do a lot less imaginative engagement. And McLeod says, no, that's actually not true. You're constantly doing imaginative, critical, creative, mental work by going from image to image to image, reading a comic, closing the gap between them. And he gives this somewhat uh, crude example of, you know, a man about to be murdered in panel one and then in panel two, you, you transition to just the cityscape and hear the scream. And McLeod says, you know, in every, uh, in every uh, scene like this, you know, every reader imagines this gruesome death a different way. Um, and, it, you know, the death, though, doesn't take place in the panels. It takes place in the gutter and in your mind. So given that, uh, and McLeod says, comics is closure. That's essentially what comics is. So given that he's come up with that idea that, that really nothing is more important than the transitions between panels, the next thing he does is he provides a taxonomy that is a, a kind of list, uh, a definitional list of all the types of transitions there can be between panels, of all the different ways in which images can be juxtaposed. And he comes up with six. Um, and this is this is solid. I think there's a lot to criticize in McLeod. And I could even criticize some of this. But I think this is a very important thing he did here, which is to provide us with a very basic way of discussing how we get from panel to panel. And this uh, has been influential. I think most people who study comics and talk about comics use this vocabulary. It's become really a shared vocabulary in discussing comics, and I think it's very useful in that way. So the first type of transition between panels is moment to moment. This is where you have two panels, and the main thing that's happened between them is that time has passed. Usually there are going to be two <clears throat> images of the same thing. 
one at an earlier time, one at a later time. So moment to moment. Number two is action to action. That is similarly, you're going to have two images probably of the same thing. And the main thing that has happened between them is that an action has occurred. Now, moment to moment and action to action can be hard to tell apart because, you know, actions consummate themselves in time. Uh, even the act of blinking as illustrated in moment to moment is an action. So, you know, there's not going to be a very hard boundary between moment to moment and action to action. But I think the idea is the emphasis in an action to action transition will be precisely on the action. The next one is subject to subject. This is where I think you have one setting, one scene, but it, you go from one, one uh, person in it, one actor in it, one subject. And I think he's using subject the way it's used in art, like the subject of a painting. You go from one subject to the next. So you have a scene where a race is occurring. One panel is the uh, runner you know, winning the race. The next panel is the person holding the stopwatch, clicking the stopwatch. So you've gone from one subject, the runner, to the next subject, the hand of the person holding the uh, stopwatch. So subject to subject. Then the most straightforward of all, I think, is number four. It's scene to scene, where one panel takes place at one place in time. The next panel takes place at another place in time. I think that's very straightforward. Number five is going to prove to be very important to McLeod's historical and cultural argument about comics. It's what he calls aspect to aspect. This is where you have a scene and a setting and you show different facets of it. I think this is different from subject to subject because in subject to subject, what you're showing um, is different sort of persons or actors in the scene. In aspect to aspect, you can show much more minuscule features of the scene. So for instance, subject to subject both has uh, a person in it. The both panels have a person in them. For aspect to aspect, we have that little still life of the beer can and cigarettes, and then we see people. So aspect to aspect isn't focused on people, isn't focused on action. It's just showing you different visual elements of the scene. And then finally, number six, not very often used except in experimental comics, is what he calls non sequitur. And that's where the two images bear no relation. Non sequitur means it doesn't follow. There's not a sequence. So the two images have no relation to one another. And, uh, and he says that's mostly going to happen in experimental comics of various kinds. So that's his taxonomy of traditions. I'm going to uh, transitions. I'm going to use these terms throughout the semester. I think they're pretty good terms. I think they give us a shared language for talking about this. And I would encourage you to, uh, you know, at least in an, in an informal way, memorize this list so you can use this vocabulary in our discussions and in your writing. Now, what McLeod does with this taxonomy of transitions is really interesting. He decides, okay, well, I've come up in a theoretical way with all these possible transitions from one panel to another, but how do they actually work out in actual comics? So he looks around and he looks at a bunch of different comics and he starts with American comics. And he, and he reads widely in terms of genre. He reads superhero stuff. He reads autobiographical stuff. He reads humorous work. He reads all sorts of comics. And what he basically finds is that in normal narrative American and European comics, he f sort of gives a chart and he finds the following. Action to action hugely predominates. Most transitions in Western comics are action to action. And even, no matter the genre, whether it's superhero or autobiographical or funny animal or whatever. And I think that makes a lot of sense if you just think for a moment that most comics tell a story. And most stories are about what people do. And so most transitions are going to be action to action because you're concerned about the actions the characters are undertaking. And then the other transitions that predominate are subject to subject and scene to scene. Uh, 
those are the big ones and you don't see very many moment to moment because that's kind of subtle that's you know not a lot of action is happening you don't see a lot of non sequitur except in experimental comics and you don't see a lot of aspect to aspect because like moment to moment it's a bit subtle you're not really telling the story you're pausing the story so well and good that makes a certain amount of sense but then the next thing mcleod did was he looked at a lot of manga he looked at a lot of japanese comics and he said that what he found was that while action to action still predominated because most comics in japan as in the west tell a story he found that there was a lot more aspect to aspect and again across genres and he's starting to ask himself even in very action-oriented comics like if you're familiar with akira very action-oriented but still has a ton of aspect to aspect and remember that's where you're pausing the story and you're just showing different facets almost like still lifes of the setting and mcleod says that this shows a cultural difference it's reflective of a broader cultural difference between what he perhaps overstates as a difference between the west and the east uh which i i'm i'm not 100 percent on board with making generalizations that large but I, I still think there is such a thing as cultural difference and i think one of the things he's observing and it's you know he's not the first to observe either among western or eastern writers is that Western culture in general has tended to be a little bit more what he calls goal-oriented than quote-unquote Eastern culture in general. Now again, this is a big generalization. I don't want to make big cultural generalizations, but other, you know, other writers have observed this as well. And his idea is that um, while this is a cultural difference, it's also, you know, we can learn from other cultures. And I think one of the things he's saying is that American and Western comics could be improved by taking on this feature of Japanese comics, that it makes their comics more thoughtful, um, less just sort of crassly, crudely action-oriented and goal-oriented, and makes them more atmospheric. And you see what he does on this page on my slide. He actually does it. He pauses his argument to create a kind of mood-setting image of himself wandering in a Japanese garden. And he's doing this to suggest that there's no problem with creating comics that aren't just about action. So he's saying we could stand to enrich our cultural sense by learning from the Japanese example. And one thing you have to keep in mind is that there was not, you know, nearly as much manga being brought into America back then as there is now. Uh, in fact, you know, there was probably very little. It wasn't like today where people can just grow up reading manga. Um, back then, you know, manga was something that people read if they were already into comics and were looking to explore further. Um, so McLeod is actually sort of, I think, usefully alerting readers to the fact that there's this world of comics out there that they might not be familiar with, that's uh, interestingly different from the comics we know, and that can be learned from. And this is part of an even broader argument that I want to get to in one second. Um, I just want to pause, though, to note that another thing McLeod emphasizes is that time is the mysterious key to comics because he says that if comics are juxtaposed spatial images that tell a story which is what they often do then you're using space to indicate time somehow you're using the space of the comics page to represent the passage of time between panels and he uses this example of a person who says something to a friend and the friend pauses and then replies and there's three panels and mcleod says you could do this straightforwardly and you would have you know you would have the, the transition between the first two panels is subject to subject and then the transition between the second two panels is uh moment to moment but he said there's all sorts of ways you could do this to indicate how much time has passed. If you did it straightforwardly, then, well, one, one sort of beat has passed. 
But if you put three panels between the question and the answer, you indicate that a much longer amount of time has passed. If you um, put extra space in the gutter between the panels, you could indicate that extra time has passed. If you elongate the panel so that your eye takes a longer time to move across it, you could indicate that more time has passed. If you open the panel border to create a kind of hazy feeling, it could cr indicate that more time has passed. And his point is that when you are making a comic, you are turning time into space. And your thoughts about how the comic is to be crafted and constructed need to be oriented toward the idea of how you can do that. So time is the mysterious key to comics. But this is all part of a broader cultural argument. And I think a lot of people have sort of missed this element of this book. They think it's just kind of a formal handbook for understanding the form of comics. I think it's an argument for placing comics in the center of particularly Western culture. Because MacLeod has a moment in the text where he gives this little sort of history of culture in the West. And he says what happens is starting in the modern period, in the early modern period, you have the growth of the scientific method, the growth of science, the growth of industrialism, etc. And he says that what this does is it kind of breaks the Western mind in two. And you have one part of the Western mind that's extremely oriented toward the experience of the real world, whether that be through the investigations of the scientific method or whether that be through the development of realism in art, which arises, you know, in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. Art in particular is moving closer and closer to trying to approximate reality. And then he says, on the other hand, you have this countervailing movement in literature and in philosophy that's getting more and more abstract the romantic movement in literature it's more and more about what takes place in your mind philosophy and Kant and, and Hegel and writers like this is becoming very abstract and oriented away from experience and so you have experience and thought and then image corresponding to experience and word corresponding to thought are getting further and further and further apart as you go from let's say 1500 to 1900 as you progress through Western modernity. Western modernity has sundered the human mind. It's driven us radically outward into experience and radically inward into thought with very little middle ground, and it's tearing us apart. And MacLeod says, well, this starts to change around 1900. What happens around 1900 is you get the emergence, number one, of new media, you get the emergence of things like cinema. You get developments in printing, like lithography, that allow for illustrated, sort of richly illustrated magazines and books, and so, which combine word and image. Cinema combines word and image. That's all taking place kind of at the ground level of mass popular culture. And then at the elite level of literary and artistic production, you're getting movements like uh, the Dadaist movement, the Futurist movement, which are bringing, they're using words like design elements. They're creating pictures that um, are sort of very abstract, almost like language. So at the high elite level of high cultural, you know, poetry and painting, you have this reunification of word and image. And you have this reunification of word and image at the lower level of mass cultural production of popular culture of media. I'm just using high and low sociologically descriptively, not as value judgments, by the way, uh, just as far as who, you know, you know, the classes involved here in consuming this media. And he says, is it, he implies, is it any coincidence that comics comes along at, at this time? Isn't comics, which uses images, because remember, he doesn't think comics is the juxtaposition of word and image. What he thinks it is, though, is the use of images as a kind of language to tell a story. 
So comics, more than any other art form, is this healing, this reunification, this re-knitting together of thought and experience in the use of the image corresponding to experience to communicate information or tell a story which correspond to thought. So comics becomes the key art form of the 20th century, the key art form of modernity, a key episode in the development of artistic and literary modernism. And that is how MacLeod justifies the idea of comics being an incredibly important medium that we all need to take account of and study. And is that an argument that's rock solid? Could we criticize that? Yes, we could. However, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to do it here, but it's a very powerful historical argument. And other later writers have developed it, such as Nick Susanis, who wrote a book called On Flattening, which, like understanding comics as a philosophical treatise in comics form, and in On Flattening, Susanis, S-O-U-S-A-N-I-S, develops this argument still further. So that is my treatment of Scott McCloud. And again, I'm not doing this to sort of give you Scott McCloud as the Bible of comics, but as a way for us to begin to think about this medium, this art form, its characteristics, and its role in the arts more broadly, so we can test McCloud's ideas against the actual books we're going to read in the course. And then I just want to end very briefly, because this course is called Readings in the Graphic Novel. I want to end with a brief explanation of this term, graphic novel, uh, and why I won't be <laughs> using it very much. So comics is the name for the art form that uses sequences of static images to create a narrative or any other type of literary structure. Or maybe, if you prefer, it's the name of the art form that spatially juxtaposes word or image. But in any event, comics is the name of the art form and comics is mainly what I will say. Graphic novel is a term introduced in the 1970s to describe book-length collections of serialized comics. It was popularized, he didn't create it, but like, like actually like the term sequential art, the term graphic novel was popularized by Will Eisner because he was doing some work at this time that he considered akin to realistic literary fiction, and he wanted to associate it with realistic literary fiction and not from superhero comics. So he comes up with this term graphic novel to describe his book, A Contract with God, which is sometimes described as the first graphic novel. There's, like with any first, there's many, many candidates for the first graphic novel, and many of them predate Will Eisner's A Contract with God. But A Contract with God is, is sometimes considered the first graphic novel, and I, th and I think it's the term, it's the book that popularizes the term. And then commercially, these collections become viable once comics are no longer distributed solely through the channels where newspapers and magazines are distributed, and they begin to appear in specialty shops, comic book stores in the 70s, and then they start being sold in bookstores around the 80s. And so um, they become commercial. It becomes commercially viable to publish comics not only as small saddle stitched pamphlets, but also as books with spines. And those books with spines sometimes collect previously serialized material, and sometimes they are original content. This is all America, by the way. There's a different history here in Europe and Japan, which we'll talk about later in the course. The problem, though, is what does graphic novel mean? Well, let's just break it down. Graphic means relating to the artistic use of pictures, shapes, and words, especially in books and magazines. So, sure, you know, graphic novels have graphics. That makes sense. What's a novel? A novel is an invented prose narrative that is usually long and complex and deals especially with human experience through a usually connected sequence of events. This is from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. So, a novel is a fictional prose narrative. A graphic novel, by contrast, would be, a pro would be a narrative told in graphics rather than in prose. That seems straightforward, except that there's all sorts of objections to this term. Let's, uh, let's think about a couple. So one of them is that it's just a marketing term, that people thought comics were for kids, 
And so they wanted a term that they could use to sell them to adults. So they came up with graphic novel, which even sounds a little sensational. It sounds like graphic, pornographic, graphic violence. Like it sounds a little sensational. So maybe this is just a marketing term. It's just to sell books to people. Number one. Number two. Is it not just a bid for cultural respectability by associating comics with novels? You're saying, hey, you can read this. It's just like a novel. But, you know, if you already liked comics, you don't need to make this concession to the already respectable. And in fact, it's a bit obsequious. It's a bit, uh, a bit, it's a bit embarrassing. It's a bit servile to make this concession to elite taste when you know that what you're already participating in is fine as it is. So those are two objections. Another objection is that many comics labeled graphic novels are not novels because novels are fictional, whereas many famous graphic novels are non-fiction, such as Art Spiegelman and Alison Bechtel's memoirs, Mouse and Fun Home, such as Joe Sacco's journalistic books like Palestine and Safe Area Garajda, or like Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, which is an, a, a, a nonfiction work, an aesthetic treatise. So the word novel does not apply to nonfiction texts. A fourth objection is that many great comics are sprawling sagas that have many, many parts that exceed the self-contained implication of the term novel. So novel, usually you pick up a novel, it's one thing, you read it, you've, it has a beginning, middle, and end, and you're done. But if you pick up one graphic novel in the Sandman series, or the Love and Rocket series, or the Preacher series, or almost you know any serialized work of manga, if you pick up one, uh, uh, they're called Tankaban in, in the Japanese, uh, one volume of Akira, or of Buddha, or of Ranma One Half, you're just getting one episode of a much more sprawling saga. And so in that case, the term novel is sort of an ill fit. My general feeling personally is that graphic novel is not really a very useful term. Uh, I think it's, I guess it's fine to have a term that describes comics, you know, with a spine in a book. And so I'll use it from time to time, but I'm fine with comics. Uh, and, and I generally, you know, if this course were called readings in comics, uh, I wouldn't do much differently with it. Um, so that's that. That is my lecture on the formal properties of comics, on understanding comics, and on comics versus graphic novel. I hope that's a useful introduction to the course. And, you know, we will now, we will have a, uh, a live discussion and see what you think about all of these ideas. Thanks very much and have a great day.